Welcome to Dearly Departed Online. I'm Scott Michaels, the creator of Dearly Departed Tours and FindADeath.com. This is my venture into audio internet. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, was pronounced dead on August 16, 1977 at Baptist Memorial Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. His death made headlines around the world and delivered this man from music legend to almost saintly status. Elvis's body was brought back to Graceland from the Baptist Hospital and laid out for viewing in the main living room of Graceland. One by one, people filed past his casket to pay their respects to the king, including Sammy Davis Jr., Anne Margaret, and Caroline Kennedy. Thousands of fans and tourists stood in line for hours, waiting to be ushered through the front doors of the mansion for a chance to say their own personal goodbye to the king of rock and roll. Because of a bizarre and tragic event that we'll talk about today, three young women wouldn't make it through the gates that day, and two of them wouldn't make it home alive. Today I'm speaking with the survivor, Tammy Bader. Tammy has written a book about the experience titled Tragic Night Between Life and Death, A Second Chance at Life. So I welcome Tammy Bader. Hi, Tammy. Hi, how are you? Great, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to uh, speak to me today. So is it true that, that you share Elvis's birthday? Yes, I do. How interesting is that? So were you a fan from when you were very, very young? Yeah, I grew up listening to him. It's all the music my mom played, but, you know, not of Elvis. So how old were you in 1977? I was 17. 17. And, and had you ever seen Elvis perform live or ever seen him in person? I had never seen him perform live. Uh, all I'd seen him was on TV. Okay. And now, where were you living in 1977? Uh, with my grandma and grandpa. Were you living in Tennessee? No, I was in uh, West Terre Haute, Indiana. Okay, so how long of a, of a distance is between the two places? Um, it was about 800 miles, something like that. Wow. Eight hour drive at that time. So when you heard that Elvis has died, you immediately, you're going to Graceland. That's what you, uh, that's what you decided. Yeah, after I let my sister know that he passed away, you know, she couldn't believe it. And, uh, I wanted to go to Memphis. Was it just something like you just hop in the car, or was there something that you had to, you know, how did you prepare for your trip? Well, when I asked my sister, when I told her that uh, Elvis had died, you know, she didn't believe me, but when she finally heard it herself on TV, you know, they confirmed it, I said, let's go to Memphis, and she said, I can't. She said, I ain't got the money. You know, nobody had it. You know, she said, I don't get paid until Friday. So it's getting the money to go. Okay, so you borrowed money just because you, you had to be there. The next morning uh, is when they announced in advance of being able to get in to view him. And I told my sister, and she said, I still don't have the money. So uh, there's nobody to borrow the money from. So I went out and I wrote a bunch of checks, and, you know, so we could get the money to go. But she said, I'll put it in the bank as soon as we get back on her payday. Well, oh, that was back when you still had a couple of days of leeway. I remember, I've done that many times where I've yeah. uh, floated a couple of checks till payday. It's just uh, what we did back then, isn't it? Well, like I said, she was going to put it right in the bank, you know, as soon as uh, she got back home. So you said it was about an eight-hour road trip? Mm-hmm. Eight, oh. eight and a half, I think, at that time, you know, just driving, what, 55 or something like that. It just depended. Sure. And so when you first got to Graceland, uh, there were probably a lot of people lined up already. Uh, when we got there, the first time we bypassed, my sister drove right by, you know, and I said, turn around and go back, you know. So she goes back and she parks down at the very tip where it starts to drive in, you know, that pulling area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we parked the car right there. But there was not one so out in front of the, the brick wall, you know, the stone wall. There wasn't one person out there and we walked clear up to the gate. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. No person out there at all. The people were on the other side of the road, but there's nobody on the side of Grace. How long of a wait were you anticipating there being until you got through the gates? We got there uh, from the time we left is around 4 o'clock in the evening on the 17th. Mm -hmm. And we arrived there uh, it was after midnight on the 18th. Okay. And did they, so they had stopped the visits at that point? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, quite a while before that. That's why my sister wanted to turn around and go back home. I see. 
So, but there was still going to be a point where you had, uh, where the hearse would go by with Elvis. So you could, sure. okay, so that's probably uh, why people were uh, were waiting. But there were a lot of people still there across the street, just kind of being around each other, weren't they? I mean, was they, did you talk to a lot of people and was there just Not a, really. No? There, everybody was, you know, real good, you know, they, you know, like telling stories. Everybody was real good and loving and everything like that, you know, uh, there wasn't anybody that was harsh or anything like that. But it was real peaceful. And just kind of just waiting. You know, like I say, though they were talking, you know, talking with each other and stuff like that. But at the time, uh, I got out of the car. I seen a couple of girls walking towards me from Carl's mm -hmm. way. And I just stood there and waited for them. And uh, they walked up to me and just started talking like those old friends, you know what I mean? And this was Juanita Johnson and Alice Hovitar? Yeah, Alice was one that's doing all the talking. Uh huh. And they were there for the same reason, basically, because everyone felt uh, the need to be there. They come, okay, whenever they walked up to me, they said, you know, after we got introduced, but they, Alice said, uh, we're not Elvis fans. We just come to check out the excitement. So, so you weren't lined up in front of Graceland, but but you were just kind of hanging out across from Graceland when uh, when the uh, accident happened. Right, you know, like I said, the girls talked to me a few minutes, you know, we kind of laughed and stuff and carried on, you know, talked a few minutes and they went their way, you know, and I went to check see if they got the car locked up yet. Mm -hmm. And I told my little six-year-old cousin, I said, Jan, I said, you wait right here for your mom, because my aunt had just told me, keep Jenny with you. She's uh, six years old. And I said, sure, but, you know, I had the camera and stuff, and I was going to go anyway. Then she waited there. You know, which is unusual, you know, for somebody who was real close anyway. But uh, she did wait there, and I headed towards uh, the boulevard. And when I got out there so far, I noticed the girls were standing out there in the road, too. They were talking to police officers. So I went on out there to where they were, the same two that I just met, Alice and Joanna. I was going to take uh, pictures of Grace and see when we first got there, my battery was dead. Mm -hmm. That's the reason we uh, left and went back down the road towards Memphis. And I could describe to you where we turned and everything. But anyway, we come back and we parked across from Grace on that time. Mm -hmm. And I had the batteries in the camera. It was ready to take pictures. And uh, that's what I went to do, you know. But I got talking with the girls. We asked Officer Greenwood, which I didn't know his name at that time. But anyway, it was Officer Greenwood that was standing out there. We asked him if it would be okay for us to stand out there. And he said, yeah. Yeah, we'd be fine. Yeah, but then when the white car flew by us like it did, he told me to get out of the road. Just so much happened in a matter of minutes there. Mm -hmm. You know, where he, he went down, he turned turns the car around, you know, comes back and, you know. So this this guy, the driver, Tretis uh, Wheeler, he, he you're, you're talking about him. Yes. So he, he did a drive-by one time. Yes. And turned around. Mm -hmm. Plus, he'd been there six hours before that. I was told by another uh, individual, um, it, she's a witness to it. He'd been there six hours before that, and they shoot him off. They just told him to go away. You know, they ran him off. So he turned around and come back that night. But she'd made a phone call, I guess, and he told them what he was going to do. You mean it was intentional? Yes. And so he, he was going to drive into the crowd? Yeah. See, he, when he called, he said Elvis was no good. He said uh, when he was going to run down, he's going to run the gates or he was going to run down some fans. Well, he didn't run the gates, and he just ran down the fans. So it wasn't just a, a stupid drunk driving thing. He was, uh, he was, he intended to go out and hurt people. Right. Huh. And, and get it in his mind. So can you explain, when he turned around, then, then what exactly do you remember happening? Well, okay, when he turned around, stuff like that, you know, there were standing, and the officer's telling us, you know, the way he just drove by, that we'd better get out of the road after all, you know. So yeah. anyways, and I'm starting to move a little bit, but once he starts roaring up his engine, stuff like that, you know, he's sitting still, roaring that engine. Um, and I've already started moving away from him. You know, because we've been told to get out of the road. And I, did, I don't, I didn't get that far. But anyway, I heard the two thumps, the squealing of the tars, you know, and everything. Anything like that would grab somebody's attention, you know. Uh, and I turned around. When I heard the thump, thump, I turned, and I threw my hands up, like, don't hit me, you know. 
he had me. Hmm. And he dragged you for for quite a distance, didn't he? See, when he rode Alice out from under the car, she's uh, blonde head, tall, slender, she's about head taller than me, I think. Mm -hmm. And Joanna was just a little, uh, I was maybe just a little taller than her, but, you know, I thought maybe it's because of her weight, because she wasn't skinny or anything like that, but she's probably about like me, just a little bit more weight on her. But anyway, she got caught on the undercarriage. But anyway, when he hit me, he flipped me up in the air, I come down. Luckily, the way I stand is one thing saved my life. When I turned around faced him because it threw my legs out from under me. Mm -hmm. He did put me on my face like he did the other girls. Mm -hmm. um, when I come down, I bounced off, you know, the windshield and stuff like that, cracking it. Uh, I went, down, went up in there and come down on his antenna. Wow. It went into my right leg, you know, and tore the muscle up. That's what he was carrying me about 20 feet on the side of the car, where they said he drugged me. Yeah. 20 feet. It was on the side of the car, but my, I wasn't touching the ground. I, I see. I was just hanging. You were hanging off of the aerial, really, the entire Right, there you go. Wow. Wow. So, now, you probably don't remember this because you were, you know, you were injured, but after, so he, as I, as I've read in, in articles and in your book, he tried to, he tried to flee the scene. Yeah. And how did they stop him? Uh, they was on foot uh, chase. Plus, well, see, whenever he was stopped there at the light, he had a police officer behind him from where, where he'd been driving, I guess. Mm -hmm. He already got the attention of the police officer. Mm -hmm. And they stopped. They got out and they was on foot. The car wasn't in pursuit then. They was on foot after the impacts of us girls. There's about, uh, what would you say, about, it's like 15 cops or something like that. I don't know exactly how many. But all of them was on foot after him. Because, see, the impact of each person like that, it slowed the car down. Sure, sure. Like I said, he's still dragging Joanna. She's attached to the undercarriage of the front of the car. Wow. And uh, so he got out of the car, and uh, and the crowd, understandably, was uh, was yelling, uh, lynch. lynch him. Uh -huh. and, uh, and the police arrested him. And uh, and took him took him away. First taken to the South Hospital, and they didn't have enough equipment. My heart had stopped twice already. After they got it going again, and they had me stabilized, they shipped me to the Methodist Central on Union Avenue. You were in the same ambulance as Elvis. Yeah. In the same gurney. Yep. Oh, that's and interesting. One thing they said, uh, the ambulance driver told me uh, that I, the man that picked me up, he said he's. On the same gurney, same ambulance. He saw what thing was different was the sheets. How interesting. So you arrived at the hospital. They, did they perform surgery right away? I mean, what, what kind of injuries did you have? You were comatose at that point, weren't you? Yeah, comatose. And, and what kind of injuries did you have then? Well, my pelvis had been broken in four places. They said shattered at the time. Uh, I had scraped scratches. You know, my ear was ripped. I had a lot of head trauma. And besides, the muscle being torn up. Uh, a big hunk out of my muscle on my leg. Uh, but I was in a coma. I kind of woke up a couple of times. I don't really remember any of it. Like, uh, I begged my mom to help me. Mm -hmm. And I went back into deep coma. And that's when they operated, like, the next day. I think that was the 27th of August. So you came out of the coma, and then you started your uh, your recuperation. You had many, many uh, surgeries after that, as I understand it. And you were, uh, while you were recuperating in the hospital in Memphis, did any of the Presley uh, people contact you? Well, Charlie Hodge had been there, come check on me and stuff while I was in the coma. Uh, who was Charlie Hodge? Charlie Hodge, that was the one that was put the scars on Elvis. Elvis was a good friend mm -hmm. on the stage. Okay. Now, he come there, and I got to know him after I was released. Uh, but anyway, um, and then Elvis's dad called my dad. And when he called, he said he was, had his uh, Sandy uh, Miller, is his girlfriend, uh, personal secretary and nurse. He had her say it was a doctor calling so that he could get hold of my dad because of too much uh, media. And uh, they apologized that he talked to my dad and asked if there's anything they could do, and they said pray. And he said, we're already doing that. And then he said, I'll be calling back. And on the 14th of September, I came out home on the 12th. The 14th, he called me, 
on the 16th, one month from the day of Elvis's death, he was in the hospital and spent the evening with me. Sound very, very nice. <laughs> And the people, the media really embraced you, didn't they? And the city of Memphis embraced you. Yeah. They were really good to me. There was somebody that showed up in the hospital room, and I, I wasn't quite sure who he was, but you said he dropped off a, a, a copy of Elvis's will. I don't know exactly who that was. Just some man knocked on the door just right before Elvis's dad got there. Uh, say that was, uh, I think you might need this something like I thought what is that and mom said it's Elvis's last will and testament I said what do you expect and so she put it in the drawer you know like I was going to sue somebody or something and that was right before Vernon came to visit you wasn't it right and you know crazy thing was nobody asked us to come there we come there on our own you know I mean there's somebody's bringing me something like that thinking I'm going to sue them or something wow yeah it's a different time though you know what I mean nowadays uh, they wouldn't think twice about suing, but yeah, I mean, you're taking, you, ultimately, you put yourself in that situation. Unfortunately, you know, it, it, it wasn't their fault, it wasn't the Presley's fault, but uh, that nowadays is such a different thing. You know, they find a way to blame the people with the money. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, it's just the way things were. So you were uh, released. It was big news, wasn't it? Yeah. And the, even the mayor gave you a key to the city? Uh, yeah, I had a proclamation from the uh, governor. Uh, I had a key to the city. Um, it was the uh, mayor's assistant, uh, Dick Hackett, that was standing at the end of the ambulance. He presented me with these awards. Key to the city, the, uh, and then uh, make me honorary citizen of Memphis, and the proclamation from the governor of Tennessee. Wow, that's and then did was it the Presleys that provided a uh, a plane for you to get home? Well, now when Elvis's dad Byrne was in the room with me, and Mr. Presley, he asked my mom. He said, "Did you get a paper like this?" And she said, "No." So she read it, and it was for air ambulance. And she went out and talked to the doctor, and he said, "No, too much cabin pressure after having brain surgery." Oh, so you didn't take the plane home? No. Okay. So he said. We'll take care of it. And they went home. I went home in a brand new Cadillac Cameron's. That's, yeah. that's a nice, that'll make an eight-hour trip a little bit nicer. But you had to go. You had to go back quite often to Memphis, didn't you, for checkups and? Once a month, I had to see the doctor. So you had to drive 16 hours a month to to go and see a doctor. I mean, how long did you have to drive to get to Memphis? I guess is what I'm curious about. Every month. Probably about. Nine hours, something like that. Just depend on the way you went, I guess. And but so they wouldn't. What I what I can't quite grasp is is why you weren't. Why didn't you have a doctor closer to home? Well, now if there's times that I couldn't make it in there, like a, a couple times there in the winter months. I think it was January, mm -hmm. January and February, maybe then two months. It might be the only two. Uh, I went to Poplar Bluff, Missouri. And there's a doctor I see in there, unless it's one of the doctors from uh, Memphis. I don't know. It's been so long, but I know I went there a couple times. And all the other times was in Memphis, so they didn't have me see anybody else other than come see them. I see. So Mr. Presley maintained contact with you, didn't he? Yeah. And you became friends with him. Yeah, I was, I was close to him. I thought the world of him. Yeah, well, I went over to his house on Dolan. You know, I seen like before the benefit concert and different things like that. Uh, that's that's where I met Vester was over at his house on Dolan. I was there with uh, this a friend of uh, Elvis's. His name is Philip Baroni, mm -hmm. and he's the one that introduced me to Vester because Vester didn't know who it was. And who's Vester? His, his uncle Vester. Oh, okay, okay. But he'd never met me until then. And he's with his wife. I think Cletus was her name, something like that. I ain't sure. Mm -hmm. That was uh, Elvis's mom's Gladys sister. But he was, he, you know, you'd go for your monthly checkups, and and quite often, usually, you'd have a nice visit with uh, with Vernon Presley. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he actually take took you to Elvis's grave uh, yourself, didn't he? Didn't he? See, he talked to me in the hospital about going with me to the mausoleum. Mm -hmm. Uh, once I got out and stuff, and then he was always working in the office or something, but I used to go to the grave before me to the mausoleum. But then they ended up having to move Elvis's body. 
him, you know, to uh, Graceland. Uh, but now he mentioned that, that that may happen at the hospital. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it was before they moved him? It was before, yeah. See, in the hospital, he mentioned, you know, they may uh, move him to, to Graceland and build a mausoleum or something from there. Yeah. But at that time, that like that happened, but he was talking to me about when I got out where I could go to the grave, he'd go with me. But now, Alstrada, Elvis is one bodyguard. Well, he was here his, uh, over his clothing or something like that, his outfits. He's the one that uh, showed me where Elvis had been entombed, you know, in the mausoleum. Mm -hmm. And he showed us exactly where it was. Okay. So, yeah, but some people may not know that Elvis, uh, they, there was an attempt to steal Elvis, uh, Elvis's body and hold him for ransom. So Vernon decided to take him and Elvis's mom and, uh, and brother and, uh, and take them to Graceland for, uh, I guess they got permission to make the, uh, the estate into a cemetery. And, uh, uh, well, you think about, uh, they had been, uh, damaging, uh, her angel. Mm-hmm doing things to it and trying to tear it up, you know. It was, you know, stupid out people's part doing something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at least you got Elvis where he was safe. Do you, now, the, the trial of Treatise Wheeling, do you remember it? Did you have to go back to Memphis for that? Uh, no, I was there the day that he'd been sentenced, you know, because I'd had my one leg operation, my first leg operation. And that was in May, let me see, May. I think it was May 9th or something like that, because it's in the paper. But it talks about where he was tried. But, see, they waited for over a year, you know, where he'd been going to court and stuff. To actually, for the whole thing to go through, because he never got nothing from me. All I think he was tried for was uh, the two counts, you know, the second degree murder. Hmm. So nothing for injuries, nothing for attempted murder. Mm-mm. How, how strange. Yeah. And he was given what kind of a sentence? He was given, uh, they said, 20 years, do 10. But the thing was, it's the first time actually being sentenced, so the 10 was cut in half. You know what I mean? And uh, then if he was a good boy, you know, for your speech, but, you know, if he's good on good behavior, that five years, that 10 is cut in half, you know, actually sentencing him. Mm -hmm. um, he only did two and a half years. Wow. For two counts of murder. That's um, yeah, that's it's crazy. Intentional. I had no idea that he had he had already done a drive by. Uh, I thought it was just something he just happened to be driving down the street and lost control. Uh, I didn't know that it was intentional. Yeah, see, he lived uh, like he lived very far from Graceland at that. Because yeah. we looked it up on my sis, my daughter, and me looked it up, and I think it's like almost two miles or something like that. That was interesting because you published in your book uh, the actual incident or accident report, and that's a fascinating yeah. document. I thought that was a, a really uh, interesting addition to the book. The uh, Have you ever been in touch with any uh, Juanita or Alice's uh, family? Uh, okay, now, as for uh, well, Joanna Johnson, her mother, I know she's passed away. As for any other of Joanna's family, no. Now, as for Alice, I'm very close to her sister, Rosemary Hovatar. I think her name is Rosemary Tucker. Hovatar Tucker. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, I'm a little sister. Uh, she, that's what she calls me now. Oh, how nice. And she says, I love you with all my heart, you know. But yeah, we keep in touch. And how about any of the other people that were in front of Graceland at that time? There's uh, Susan Wahlberg. Uh, she was one of the witnesses, she was one of the eyewitnesses, and then uh, Kathy B. is another lady that was there. So people have really shown a lot of love to you, haven't they? Yeah, they really have. And it's nice that you have people that were there that night that understand what you went through. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm thankful, you know, the fact that I'm alive. I was blessed with two daughters. The doctor didn't know for sure if that would even happen. But I got lucky. You know, God had a purpose for me, you, you know. did. And just like your book says, it's a second chance at life. You had, uh, yeah, you were very fortunate. I, I, it just, you, you went through hell, but uh, but you came out of it. 
if I could take anything back, you know, it would be that the other two girls, I wouldn't trade anything that I went through. But as for the other two girls losing their lives, I wouldn't want that to happen. That's one thing I'd take to stop from happening, that I'd go through what I did. You know, it was uh, very special, the time that, you know, that I had with uh, Elvis's dad. I have to ask you a question about something that I found really curious. One of the people that helped you that night, uh, his name was Donald Beatty. Uh, what, what, what happened with him? I mean, he, he was a little bit obsessed with you, wasn't he? Yeah, he thought I should marry him after that. Uh -huh. how, how long after the accident did he get in touch with you? Mm, well, so he kind of kept in touch with Mom uh, during the whole thing, and I think it was right after. And he, know, he, I think he, while I was in the hospital or something. I'm not exact on that part there, but I know he thought I should marry him. And um, uh, I don't remember exactly how we finally got come face to face. If it had to be in Memphis where he had approached me, you know what I mean? And then uh, on my second... Uh, my first leg operation, he was harassing me on the phone. And uh, by that time, I'd already learned, you know, I wasn't about to marry the man. You know, and this is months later, but, yeah, because uh, Mr. Press couldn't get through to me, and I kind of got chewed for that. When he got through, he wanted to know who had been on the phone, and I explained the situation to him, and he was okay with it. But he been harassed himself that day, Mr. Presley had. By the same guy? No. Oh, okay. Um, Joanna's family, I wanted him to pay for the funerals. Oh. He constantly, he would confide in me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this was a constant thing, and, you know, he'd be upset about it. And he'd tell me, you know, they called him before he even got his gate closed at home. Okay, okay and things like that. Right. Alice's family, you know, didn't do that. It was the other family. Uh, all I know, you know, he just, how he's upset, though. So, Mr. Mr. Beatty, you finally got rid of him. Yeah, now, later, uh, I don't know, I've got the paperwork on it. Uh, now, he was put to death, was last year, year before last, something like that. He was executed? Yes. And why was he executed? He killed a little girl uh, in 85. So this is a guy that was obsessed with you, wanted to marry yeah. you. He said, why would he kill a little girl when he helped me? And he used to put my name out there, you know, like he'd done so much for me. And I said, all he'd done was got his picture taken. He wasn't a paramedic or anything. He just had his hand on my knee in the pictures. He even sent a marshal to my house to find me. To wow. ask the uh, governor for a pardon for him. I said, what did he do? And he said, well, I don't know. Well, of course he knew, but he wasn't going to tell me. Well, when I called him, I said, I looked up, I found what he did. I said, I would help him for nothing. I got kids of my own grandbabies. For him to kill a little girl. That's uh, that's crazy. Well, and, and he's gone. He's he's dead now. Yeah. Wow. He's finally sentenced, and I guess, you know, it was a relief to the family after all the years they waited because he'd been put on death row all that years. That's really crazy. Yeah, because, see, I didn't know anything about it until whenever that marshal popped up my house showing a badge at me, and I'm like, okay. And then he starts asking me questions, you know, and I thought. So tell me about your uh, your life after the accident. You, you you mentioned you have a couple of uh, a couple of babies and a grandchild? Yeah, I've, well, actually, I've got uh, eight grandkids. Uh, there's Three boys and five girls. That's a that's a heck of a house full, huh? Your holidays must be wonderful. Oh yeah, they are. You've probably become sort of a a celebrity in the Elvis Presley world. Is that right? Would that would that yeah. be correct? Whenever somebody hears my name or something like that, and I'm down there, yeah. And you go to Elvis events? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, let me see. I never, it's been years since I got a chance to go back until finally I was able to go back the uh, last three years I've been there. Yeah, this would be like the third time I'll be going back this next year, but uh, I was there this year, last year, and the year before. Um, but, 
it was just so hard, you know, with kids growing up and stuff. So you do, well, that's nice that, they, that you can go back and, and uh, it's just, it's, you're, it's such a horrible thing you went through, but it's so interesting and so probably nice that people, a lot of people know what you went through. You know, sometimes when, when people have something bad happen to them, it only happens to them and they have no one to really, that can really relate to them, you know, what they went through. But you have just, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that probably know exactly what you went through. Mm -hmm. I think right. that that's kind of fortunate, I think, that uh, th something like that will never get forgotten. Well, uh, when I spoke to you uh, a couple of months ago, you were going back to Memphis for a visit, and you mentioned the possibility of meeting uh, Treatise uh, Wheeler. Did, you, did that happen? No, it didn't happen. I tried uh, everything I could. I was told even to go on uh, oh, Ancestor.com and I could find out where he was. At one time, I... I had called and spoken to his mother. Uh, I think her name is Olivia. Uh, I spoke to her, and I don't know if she's still alive. The number it went on a vacation, like for a good while, and then I think it's totally disconnected. But by the map and stuff, it shows like the properties are gone where he had lived. Oh, they've been destroyed. Yeah, where they're building some kind of a new thing. So I think what happened is that. Uh, property was bought out from under them, uh, but there's a couple of wheelers that's listed that when I've called, you know, nobody knows and we're ain't going to say. I see. Yeah, that's I'd love to be just ask him, you know, how do you sleep? You know, does it bother you? I, you know, things I wonder about, you know, like I said, I'm no judge, no jury, I'm not God. He has to face God one day for his wrongs, so, you know, that's just the way it is. Well, listen, Tammy, now, when people want to, uh, when someone wants to buy your book, how do they do that? Okay, I've got Facebook. Mm -hmm. They can go through the Facebook account, or they could write me at my home address. Well, why don't we, why don't we stick with Facebook? And then, so it's under Tammy Bader at Facebook, right? Tammy, B-A-I-T-E-R. And they can contact you directly on your page, and, uh, and, and you get the book through through the internet. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Right. And um, and I uh, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me. I want to ask you two quick questions, though, before we go. What's your favorite Elvis song? <laughs> Kentucky Rain. <laughs> Kentucky Rain. Okay, and one other thing, and this is silly, what do you think about the rumors about Elvis being alive? <laughs> that's, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what. If it was, I think it'd be fantastic. It'd be a blessing, you know. I don't know. I wish it was. I wish it could be true, but I don't think it is. Right. I thought for a long time, you know, the other two, neither one of the other girls was born on that same day, okay? But God chose me to be the one to live born January the 8th. You know what I mean? I was putting the same animals as him. My heart stopped twice. Uh... There's a reason for that, a message that God's given to the people, but what is that message? You know what I mean? It kind of mm -hmm. makes you wonder. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, Tammy, again, uh, people can contact your, you on Facebook, Tammy Bader. Uh, and the book, again, is called Tragic Night Between Life and Death, A Second Chance at Life. And uh, thank you again, Tammy, for spending time with me. And uh, I wish you all the very best. Well, thank you. Thanks, Tammy. Bye-bye.